So today I'm going to be talking to you about business models for science-based ventures, why they're so important, why they're so powerful, and also what, what is entailed to make them successful and to unleash that power and unleash that impact. Um, with Diana's kind intro, you hear, heard a lot about what my career has been. And so I thought what I really wanted to focus on was the research that this is based on. Because one of the beautiful things about the II program at SFU is that not only is it based on decades of experience, but it's also based on decades of research into how to create impact out of university um, innovations and how to take those university um, innovations and create the ecosystems, the conditions that are required for them to thrive. And so some of the papers that I've been working on in the past have included, what does a business model look like for a science-based venture? And also, what does its evolution look like? Because one of the things you will have heard in John's talk is that the timeframes for science-based ventures are significantly more than a lot of the digital ventures that we base research off now when we talk and that we base university uh, entrepreneurship research off of and also how to create value from those university spin-offs. And so often that has to do with the ecosystem that's either being created or that is changing because of new capabilities brought on by these new technologies. And so I'm very much looking forward to speaking about that. So for those of you who weren't here last time, Dr. John Thomas, who also teaches in the IDI program, talked about an intro to business models for science-based ventures. And for those of you who may not be as familiar with the business model concept, it's worthwhile knowing that there is not a significant agreement on exactly the definition for a business model. However, there are some commonalities um, that we can give an overarching definition. Really, business models are the activity system leading to value creation. So what do you do that allows you to create value for others? Um, whether that's economic value or social value. And Massa et al. also talks about business models as the way an organization sets itself up to achieve its goals. One of the important points there is an organization does not necessarily mean a venture or a startup. It may be a university, it may be a lab. So these kind of concepts, like everything in the eye to eye program, are applicable whether you're going to go into industry, whether you're going to stay in your lab and create value, uh, that way, or if you are going to start a venture. Really, what a business model is, is the architecture for value creation. How the things that you do inside your organization, how you match them with what happens outside your organization in order to achieve value for all parties. Because one of the other things that's really important um, for science-based ventures is that they tend to have a more complex ecosystem that they're working with. And the more complex an ecosystem you're working with, the more players need to be happy with what's happening to go along to achieve this new vision. And that complexity also needs to be reflected in your business model and how you set up your organization. One of the other pieces that uh, John emphasized was that science-based companies and startups in general often struggle with product market fit. And what that means is often we have a fantastic science but we don't necessarily have a market need, or at least it hasn't been matched with one. And one of the reasons that's so challenging is that the business model, as John presented, is all focused around and starts with something called a value proposition, which is the value you say you're creating, why you're unique and special, and who you're creating value for. If you can't answer the who are you creating value for, the rest of your business model is going to be incredibly challenging to come up with. Um, and he also gave some fantastic examples, and I'll also try to pepper this presentation with um, some examples that we can work with. So if we are going to define business models as a high overview, I talked about it as the architecture. Another way to look at it is the blueprint for your business. But another piece that may be even more useful, especially for the science-based innovators, is your business model is really your narrative. What is the scaffolding for your story? that says there is a vision that we can achieve with this amazing technology or this amazing science. And here's the plan to get to get there. Here's how everything, the activities, the resources need to be set up or reconfigured in order to make this vision a reality. And 
the other piece, and I would show you a clip if you were in my class, so hopefully this is part of the selling point, um, is the absence of underwear gnomes. And for anyone who has watched the cartoon South Park, um, and this is part of storytelling, because I dare you to forget that I said this, it is essentially saying underwear gnomes in South Park are a type of creature that has a plan to steal all of the underwear in South Park and to become millionaires. But they had a slideshow uh, that they presented, as so many entrepreneurs do, and it went steal underwear, question mark, massive product. Your business model is what connects that, uh, that idea to that value creation. If there's a big question mark in the middle, if you don't have that value proposition, if you don't have that business model, then why should someone buy into your narrative? So if you remember nothing else, I suspect that you will remember that. When we talk about science-based business models, it's important to realize that while a lot of the models and concepts that have been developed around business models have been developed with technology in mind, it's often a technology that's not doesn't have a significant amount of market uncertainty of technological uncertainty. And because of that may not and, and other conditions may have a significantly smaller time to commercialization, which means there's significantly less market risk and to go along with a significantly less uh, technological risk. So a science based venture has a significant uh, commercialization cost also has a significant R&D cost, also has a significant timeline, which means these, these are one of the reasons it can be challenging to commercialize something that's based on science, because the other option is to invest in these quick to market ventures. That being said, it's a lot of important things that come along with science based ventures. So this, this table also outlines the costs and uncertainties with science based ventures and you can notice that an IT venture um, may take under two years to develop with very little um, investment required and very low uncertainty. And these other things have very high uncertainty, uh, very high commercialization costs, very high R&D costs. So why do we want to invest there when this is, there's so, so many other things that we can put our money in and get faster returns? Well, more investment, more impact. So, there are significant, and this is important whether you are to know whether you're a scientist, whether you're in government, whether you are in uh, the corporate life, what have you, is that with this wide breadth of impacts, often these scientific discoveries are generic in nature. It means they can go lots of different places, which means many, many applications. The ability to reshape maybe not one, but many different markets and the trajectory and impact of many different solutions. Often these kind of solutions are also life-saving or they might be ecologically transformative. You know, we're talking to um, Nano Medicine Network today, but if you were speaking at say about climate change, recent research has suggested that about 50% of the technologies we're going to need to really combat climate change are still sitting in the lab. And if we could get them out there, they would help us transform uh, what we're doing to the environment. If we're talking to government, one of the things to emphasize is that science-based ventures and science labs are regionally sticky, and that is actually a technical term. And that stickiness means it's difficult, it can be easy for a startup or something based in apps to get up and leave and follow investment. But if you are attached to a scientific lab, you need to stay there. So a uh, example that I'll bring up later is one of Cambridge University's most successful um, startups in the material sector. And to this day, even though uh, over a decade ago they were bought by Sumitomo Chemical in Japan, they're still based in Cambridge. Um, they create inroads to science labs. The more of these kinds of ventures that we have who have ties to scientific labs, the faster and easier it is to get those amazing advances out into the market. And also this creates fulfilling jobs for researchers. Um, when we look at uh, the kind of jobs that you can get if you have a PhD, these, these kind of jobs, the ability to take what you've been working on and turn it into impact, 
um, is very attractive for a number of reasons. And some examples that I can give you, I spoke about CDT. Uh, CDT has a polymer organic vitamin diode technology. And they, they originally started being a material in the ICT space or in the information technology space. But since being acquired, they have now branched out into healthcare, into food and agrochem, and also to energy and resources. So this is the power of those technology-based uh, research companies. Um, endomagnetics is actually, it is not a university spin out. It is the third company of someone who spun out their research from the university and is still based in the UK. And they do uh, nanoparticles for breast cancer detection to replace um, uh, radioactive materials. So huge potential uh, for positive impact. And also through the eye to eye program, we see significant potential coming out of some of our startups like Nano Sentinel, which is a company that uh, can detect uh, nanoparticles for health and safety. And also Nanex that is looking at how do we um, make stints um, for operations uh, much more effective and to significantly decrease uh, infections and those other challenges. So these are the kind of impact ventures that come out of university labs and come out of research networks. It's important to realize that what the business model does is it connects that this business idea and that's that comes out of the science base you can see over here on the left hand side. And it starts creating a narrative of how do you take that idea build a resource base around it, which means amass the resources that you need in order to create a product, create value, um, which is can be scientific value, can be uh, social value, can be often measured in economic value, but essentially means don't go out of business while you're trying to make this impact. But you can also see on the right hand of this slide, which I'm pretty sure is the way that this is facing for you guys, what you can see is there's also a significant ecosystem on the other side. There are manufacturers, there are distributors, and actually, even before you get over there, at the resource building cycle, there are partners, there are research facilities you can work with. There is a number of different parties that can be brought together, and the business model helps you to do that and to continue this value creation cycle. One of the most important concepts then to understand is the innovation ecosystem. So the innovation ecosystem is the collaborative arrangements through which firms combine their individual offerings into a coherent customer facing solution. And this is based on the work of Ron Adner, and this is with specific papers from 2006. And one of the important things to realize is that there are a number of different players in the ecosystem and those players um, all contribute something different to your business model and to how you can create value. So upstream suppliers are who do you, who are you dependent on for your product? So if I may be creating a cool nanotechnology product, I might not be making my own materials. So my upstream suppliers would be the people making these novel materials. CDT might be one of those. There are also your downstream adopters. So again, one of the challenges of a university spin out and for generic technology is often that you're significantly removed from the end user. It may be my product needs to go into someone else's suite of products, which needs to get adopted by the healthcare system, which will then go to doctors and users, et cetera. And the important thing to remember about downstream adopters is that if there are people between you and your end customer, absolutely every organization in there needs to see some value in participating. Otherwise, it doesn't matter how much value there is for that end consumer doesn't matter how much there is for that end user because there's no reason for the other players to adopt. And you often see this particularly challenging in healthcare sectors and healthcare startups because the value that they're creating, this could save lives. Uh, this could drastically increase quality of life. It seems like a no brainer if you look at the value creation, the value prospect just to that end user and don't realize that you need a value proposition for every user in between. Otherwise, you're not going to get that adoption. And so understanding that and understanding that early, is very important and it's very important to build into this model and ecosystem. 
your complementers are something that isn't taken into consideration in most other supply chain models. And these are people who they make complementary solutions. So to take a low tech example, this might be if you're a computer manufacturer, a complementer for you might be someone who makes printers. Same thing if you have a type of nanotechnology, I'm going to use um, an example from Cambridge that has to go into uh, human other go has to go into people, but needs an applicator. You don't make the applicator. Your complementer might be the person who makes that for you. Your end customer kind of does what it says on the tin. Um, it's also important to realize that your end customer and your end user may not be the same thing. Your end customer may be um, the person who writes the check. That may be an insurance supplier, that may be a doctor's office, but your end user would be, say, a patient. And so that's also important to keep in mind. And then we have something called influencers. So influencers are things like policymakers or anyone who has the influence to change how your ecosystem is shaped and to either remove or increase barriers. So they don't necessarily go into normal models because they may not have as much influence, but as we know for adoption of new technology, adoption of new standards, what is happening in government or health policy can make or break whether or not you can get into the market. So an example of ecosystem modeling that I really like, and I suggest you use if you're thinking about how you might get some of your innovations from your lab into the market, is also from Ron Adner. And he maps out this innovation ecosystem as not just here are my supplies and here's how I get to my customer, but also what are the other, what are all the other pieces that are going to be bundled and who is going to influence uh, what we can and cannot do. So whether or not a certain material can actually be in a patient, whether or not um, there is a easy way to get adopted into the healthcare system, whether there are goals for the healthcare system or for standards of care, all of those things will influence how quickly or slowly you can get into the market and where barriers will be. So I've painted a picture that's fairly complicated, but there's a power in complexity. And so I'm going to come back to a paper that I worked on with Elizabeth Garnsey at the University of Cambridge a few years ago, which looked at what are the partnerships the university spin outs and in fact university labs come into this too what are the partnerships that they require to successfully create value and in this case we looked at value creation as revenue over time but even if you're looking at social value revenue is also important because it means you're not going to go to business anytime soon and so what we found was that the most successful ventures that were coming out in this advanced technology space from university spinouts, they were making better use of partnership opportunities than anyone who was struggling or making medium value creation. So we looked right across who was having what results. And one of the things we found was that it wasn't necessarily number of partnerships that was making the difference. It's not more partners, the better. It was the more types of partners, the more breadth of partners, that was what seemed to be making the difference for these high value creators. So most university spin out companies realize two different types of partners or three different types of partners are important. One is their home university. They get that's important. That's their home. That's where they came from. They also understand that corporate partners are important. They've heard of licensing. There are big companies that are going to want to take your technology, put it into their products and go. Okay, we know that narrative and venture capital because we know we're going to need money. However, the kind of partnerships that the high value creators were exploiting were also with other universities. They were with government networks. They were, were with other university spin out companies that were making complementary technology. And if nothing else, allowed them to know who else is working in this space. And this is important, and we would get into it in the class, but we do not have time for it now. Um, there is also an entire a section of collaborative strategy that's worth thinking about. Because often when we move from a mindset of a scientific, um, of a researcher, where we want to share our research, publish it, et cetera, 
uh, there is often a feeling of when I get into the commercial world, I need to keep this to myself. Someone could steal it. And of course you want to protect yourself, but not at the expense of not knowing what everyone else is doing. So particularly in a country like Canada, where we do not have, as we're very small population wise, we don't have um, the ability, the necessity to be competitive amongst each other. It's much more powerful to know who's doing what in your space so that you can know where those opportunities for collision and complementarity actually happen. So many, but that is a challenge because because of that narrative that someone's going to steal my idea, often we get away from wanting to share our ideas and that can be dangerous. It's also important to know that not all partners play the same role. So there's something called an exploration partner. So an exploration partner is someone who also wants to advance the science, also wants to adapt, advance that mission, wants to see you um, make good on all of your scientific vision, what your technology can do. So that may be your home university, that might be other labs in your university, that might be uh, national or other or international university partners. It may be other university spin out companies who need something that you're creating or who you need something that they're creating. So these are the partners that you can have very early and they have that objective. The other um, set of partners that you can have are called exploitation partners. And those are the ones that they're interested in helping you get to market whether it's a corporate partner that either wants to give you access to manufacturing capabilities, wants to put you into their products, et cetera, may end up, depending on where we're telling our stories, may end up being something that acquires you later. There are also funders, et cetera. But it's important to understand that an exploitation partner has bought into the vision of where you think you are going commercially. And if you pivot and change, they're probably not going to be as happy with that because they've now invested in a direction you said you were going, which makes it all that much more important to explore and make use of those exploration partners. So there's a huge amount of power in a network. So looking at that CDT company I was talking about, they essentially created a network safety net effect, which was nobody wanted to see them fail. And this is the importance of having a collaborative strategy. If you are part of a network that wants to see a bigger vision, that wants to see something happen, wants to see transformative change, then there is power in that because people want to see you succeed. And so often we, we talk about competitive strategy to people who don't want you to succeed. So it's important to balance both of those. So a note from an expert is Stuart McTavish, who is the former executive director of Ideaspace, with his early stage incubator in Cambridge. And I had asked a number of experts, what is your advice for scientific entrepreneurs? And he said, your area of expertise is a great network to search for the future problems that occur, should they need to pivot or change the underlying technology. Sometimes once you leave academia, you forget the pre-existing network of that pre-existing network or think it's not relevant. So there is still value in where you came from. There's a great, great deal of power in where you come from as a science-based venture. And it's important to continue keeping that in mind. This is where vision comes in. So most of the time when business models are presented, we present the business model canvas, which is certainly your friend, I've used it for my company, I've used it for um, my um, incubator, used it for the Chang Institute. And it's great, however, there's a significant piece missing. And that is your vision, and that is your purpose and your objective. And one of the reasons it's so important to add this piece is when you are creating this, vi this vision, when you're creating your own vision of what is the world going to look like if you're successful? If that change, that's what people buy into, especially early on when they want to partner with you. They want to make a difference. They want to see lives saved. They want to see this come to these kind of amazing innovations come to light. And so your vision, your purpose, and your objective needs to drive the rest of your decisions in how you organize your ecosystem, how you organize your business, how you bring those two together to create value. And the reason I've got soft costs and soft revenues here is because that's more than just money. 
that is looking at the kind of outcomes which are lives saved, quality of life, et cetera. Um, for, for patients, if you're in clean tech, it may be things like carbon out of the atmosphere, et cetera. And so it's important to realize that this is about far more than just making money. It is about bringing a vision to life, making the world better and organizing yourself, yourself to do this. Now, <laughs> one of the favorite models that I like to look at is called the golden circle. And it essentially says, we talk so much as companies and often we talk about uh, talk as researchers about what we're doing. But the real power is aligned with that vision I talked about before, is that vision of why are we doing this? Why should we all come together to do this? And if you can paint that picture of first why and then the how, which is your business model, and then embed the what, which is the research, you're so much more powerful. But we often get stuck on the what. Uh, the, of what we're doing rather than the why and the how. And the why is what we buy into, what others buy into. So this is where, if we were in a class, I would be diverging into the importance of creative strategy and the importance of collaborative and also competitive strategy. And that's because it's important when you're creating this vision, when you're creating this path to follow, that not only do you have an answer for why you're doing what you plan to do, why you came up with this path to success, but also to be able to say why you're not doing different pieces, why you're doing certain things first, or why you're not doing that all. It shows that you've done your homework, shows why you've made the choices you're making, which also emphasizes the need to come up with more than one strategy. And this is also a challenge that we saw when we did some research with startup entrepreneurs in the science field is that often they for folks on their science, they created the first business model. And then after they created the first business model and the first strategy to go with it, they then just tried to execute. And the challenge with that was with so many moving pieces with learning so much as you go out to market, not reevaluating your strategy, not coming back and saying, what could we do? left them open to uh, strategic blind spots. And it also meant they didn't necessarily have good answers when they went for funding, because so often uh, early stage uh, funder wants to ask, well, why didn't you do this? I have ideas for this. I have experience with this. Why aren't you doing it the way I would expect you to? And so knowing the answers to that is critically important, but that's a story for another day because freely, where I wanted to get to with this was the importance of the business model as a structure for a narrative. So what your business model really is, is saying, this is the vision that I have for the world. This is specifically the value that I wanna create that I think will get us to that vision. This is how we're going to do it. And this is how we need to bring players together in order to do that. And so that essentially says, I'm going to tell you a story of how we're going to get from this incredible vision to this impact. So it's not as simple as a model. It's not as simple as a business plan, although those are very important. And it's for a very significant reason. Humans often like to think that we are entirely rational um, and you just give us the facts and we will make the right decision. But actually, human beings are very emotionally driven. We make mental models and we don't necessarily like them to be disrupted, especially if they're connected to emotional triggers. And this can be both challenging because then you can present an incredibly compelling uh, vision for the future. But if it gets in the way of what people are already doing, what they're already invested in, they don't want to hear it. And so stories give us that ability to open up someone's mind to this vision for the future, and then make an emotional connection so their mind is open and then help us get there. And also, if you're, whether you're going to talk to a partner, whether you're going to talk to a funder for a government lab or for your venture, it's important to realize that stories are also how human beings remember. It's how we organize information. And so being able to tell me a story of this is where we're going and how uh, allows me to get things to grab onto. And the better you tell that story, 
if there aren't holes in your narrative or aren't there places where I, you lost me because I disagree with you. Making things very simple, very compelling, um, allows me to better remember what it is you wanna do and see myself in that story. And if you can paint me as your listener into the story, all that much better. When I teach storytelling and business models to my students, I often say, you have to approach this in three steps. And that is first the heart, then the head, then the wallet. So you may think if we start with, you know, 25% of X of people experience a problem, that's a big number, you should have my attention. Probably you should. However, if you talk about a problem, often just starting with one slide on this is the vision, this is the problem that we're addressing, this is why it's so critical now, you've made an emotional connection. So if you can make an emotional connection, I will now want you to give me the facts so that I can retrospectively justify what I want to believe because now I want to help you. So first heart, then head, and then once, once you have a compelling plan, that's when you go for the wallet, right? That's when you go for not just money, but resources or collaboration or what have you. So it's important to realize that the business model is about far more than just, this is how my business fits together, but this is how my, my vision is going to become reality. And also, why now? So why do I want to be a part of this? And also realizing, why is this so important? And so one of the other critical factors to realize, and this is one of the reasons those influencers are so important, but it's also where market and technological uncertainty come together, is why now is a critical part of the story to be able to answer. Why do I want to participate in this? And now why is the time? Why are the conditions set up for this to happen now? Why didn't this happen three years ago? Why won't this be actually happening three years from now? Right, so this is a compelling part of the story. It also needs to be taken into consideration. And so that leads us to the, the end of the taster for the eye to eye course and also to the business models for science-based ventures, why they are so uh, important. And one is that science-based business models are so different. They have, they have to take into consideration that market uncertainty, that technological uncertainty. Um, they are, have the power to create that incredible impact, not only transformative to industries, but also to make people's lives better and to focus us and help us solve some of the most pressing challenges that we have. They need to be able to reconfigure or weave a safety net of support. So realizing that your business model isn't just articulating your competitive strategy, but it's also articulating your collaborative strategy. Where are you going to get resources from? Where are you, who is going to come with you on this journey to value creation? And that science-based entrepreneurs need business models all that much more because they need to be good storytellers. They need to be able to say how we're gonna get from this big vision to um, reality. And that's particularly important because you essentially, the more effort I'm gonna to have to put in, the more compelling a value proposition you're gonna to have to put together. And so often the kind of challenges that we're trying to solve seem nebulous. They seem so big, how could we even bite off a chunk? And your business model and the narrative that goes along with that helps you get to that point. And it is also so that your business model becomes the scaffold for your story and becoming a compelling storyteller. So whether you are a science-based entrepreneur, whether you want to take um, your science and make impact in industry, whether you want to be the kind of scientist that can get amazing uh, grants to take their innovations further, you still need to be able to bring people along on your journey. And so that's where the business model can be so powerful. So I've opened, opened a lot of doors and I'd love to go in more into that in the Q&A, but also remember that we have two different versions of the eye to eye program that are, we're recruiting for at the moment, both the eye to eye with my tax and also the in-person West Coast eye to eye uh, that is being delivered at SFU. And so with that, I saw that I've got a couple uh, already of questions already, or at least I've got some flashes that say something wants my attention. And so I will open it to questions. Our first question is from Brenna Rao, 
and it is, how did you evaluate the quality or breadth of partnership? So with the quality and breadth of partnership, what we looked at for the breadth of partnership was all the different partnerships that they had. So we first cataloged every partnership that we could find or, and then spoke for the ones we did case studies on, talked about all the different partnerships that they had, and then looked at, could we create categories for those? And then when we looked at the quality of partnership, we looked at what are these university spin-offs getting from the partnership, right? So a, I believe we had a scale of zero, one, two. And so if they were getting um, money and access to complementary resources and access to markets, that would be a two. If they were getting um, money, but not necessarily help into the market, that might be around a one. And uh, for zero, it might be something along the lines of, we released something together, we put a press release together and no one can find what this did. Thank you. Leah, do we have any other questions in the chat or any raised hands? Yes, we do. We have a raised hand from Sheldon Decomb. So Sheldon, I will allow, or I will let you talk on my side. So please unmute yourself and ask your question. Oh, thank you. Can you hear me? Yes. Great. Uh, thank you for this very interesting presentation. Uh, I had a question. What are your thoughts on open source business models, especially like around the open hardware community? And where would you set the limit to the risk of being open source versus what it can bring you? That is a great question. So my thoughts around open source are how does this fit into the strategy, the value creation strategy that you have created? So if you, uh, open source is neither good nor bad. It depends on what it's going to do for you. So often, especially early on in a science-based venture or a manufacturing venture in general, there are a lot of what we call make or buy decisions, which means uh, are these things that we should make in-house or some things that we source in? And if time to market is a significant consideration, if your opportunity window is coming up very quickly, it may make sense to make a decision that to open source what you can because you then don't have to make it yourself. Um, the counter to that argument would be how dependent are you on this and how much control do you have over whatever you took that was open source? So if something changes, is, is it going to materially impact your ability to deliver on your product later on? Or if they decide to insource the next, make the next version not available, is this going to completely change the way your company functions? Or are you gonna to have to start making things in house? So there's a sort of a balance between access and speed and also the dependence that it creates. So you essentially need to walk through your strategic decisions to find out if this is gonna create a level of dependence you're comfortable with and also whether it is going to help you with whatever your strategic objectives are and how that balances out. Okay, thank you. Sure. Leah, any further questions? Not at this time, no. Great, because Sarah, I've been dying to ask you this question. I was fascinated with the comment that you made that high value creators are involved, typically involved in what you call government networks. As a network of centers of excellence, is right. NMEAN a government network? Is that what you meant? Really? What do you mean by government networks? So there's quite a lot of them. So we have a number of NCEs uh, in Canada and across the world. Um, there are also, especially I'm, I'm thinking right now of examples in the UK where there may be a certain type of technology or a certain problem that the government is actively trying to figure out how to bring the smartest people together and to give them resources. So it might be something like a nanotechnology fellowship um, where people who are working on the newest stuff may be coming from different research labs, different universities, not necessarily getting together and getting together with the challenges that the government is hoping that they'll solve. So they will actively try to bring them together and point them toward challenges, sometimes with funding involved, et cetera. And so those kind of uh, partnerships can help with access to funding, access to other partners, uh, access to those networks. And they play a significant role, especially at the early stage, not only of bringing you the resources you need, but also of making sure that you know what other people in your space are doing who could be a good partner. Because also, if, if you're finding people you can work with, 
who are doing things that you don't have to do. And this builds on Sheldon's question of what, what should you bring into your company versus make yourself, and sort of paraphrasing that. Um, it may be that someone has something that's going to save you a lot of time if you work with them versus try to do it yourself. And so often at the very early stages of an emerging industry, most companies are trying to make everything themselves because they're trying to create the entire industry. But as things move forward, you start to see companies specialize. And when companies start to specialize, then they also need to know how they work with each other to create that final solution. And that's where that ecosystem starts to mature and evolve and adapt. Mm -hmm. And um, so just to take that another step further, um, in terms of Canada and its desire in many fields, in our own field of nanomedicine, there is a desire, there's actually a current effort to build out and scale the nanomedicine ecosystem in this country. And Edmund is participating in that. Um, and it is a government-led organization. But what are, the, what are the barriers or the gaps in Canada to the development of these ecosystems, either spontaneously or um, organically? I, and that's probably the same thing. And I'm thinking in contrast, uh, contrasting it with, um, say, Israel, where there's a lot of credit given to military service, where you put scientists and machinists and pipe fitters and pilots all in the same unit. And when they leave, um, who knows who knows what is very obvious to them because they've met these other people, worked with them and developed those trusting relationships in an incredibly diverse and kind of almost random fashion. Yep, You're, there's a lot of points there, all of which are incredibly important. Um, in, so US has the military industrial complex, right? And one of the things that allows is that they have most large government entities have to give a certain percentage of their funding to help with the commercialization of new technologies. So that's called the um, Science Business uh, Innovation Research Grants. And those help companies go from a small stage, a proof of, con proof of market to proof of concept, to moving on to the last stage being you get a government contract. So they essentially create a continuum. It does drive toward the military, but it drives demand, right? So it allows for more of a market pull. And a lot of countries don't have that, right? And so where that market pull is can be confusing. And it's one of those places where these government networks can play a role is helping create that North Star. Mm -hmm. And create this. This is these are the vision that this is the vision that we're working toward together. Um, one of the things that I wish this didn't come up so often was that because, the, as I said before, the government in the U.S. is going to put money toward it, and Canada has been really lucky to have our government put money into innovation, but it's not anywhere near the scale that many other countries have. Mm -hmm. We also have a number of challenges. So I'll just speak on the Canada side. Um, we have a culture problem within academia a lot of the time, which is that business is seen as evil. Um, and it's very, it's like I had a student tell me that point blank. Um, granted, he told me, I used to think that business was evil. And then we took eye to eye and I realized that business wasn't evil. Um, but we are coming from that. There is a purity. Often there's a purity of research. And even if you agree that impact is important, one of the challenges with university researchers are we're not really, um, we're not given any credit for doing it. We're giving credit for publishing papers and teaching classes. Um, if you are changing the trajectory of an entire ecosystem, that doesn't show up easily on your evaluation, right? So you have that, that challenge as well. We have been making some progress in bringing together incubators and networks to help people get to know each other better. But one of the challenges that we also have is that for some reason, and we found this when we did the supercluster initiative, so there are a lot of companies that had more connections in the states than they even did down the street from themselves. And so we seem to be more, more aware of what's happening internationally than we're necessarily sure of what's happening in the ecosystem. So that's another place where these uh, centers of excellence and these networks play a big role is you know, who is doing things down the street from you rather than you having to go to say Colorado. Um, so, and what we're doing right now, having this uh, webinar, 
to all of these fantastic researchers and scientists being able to say, you know, here are some of the things that are available to you. Having that, investing early in culture change makes a significant difference. But we're also finding, you know, we talked earlier about eye to eye saying we, we'd like to have ventures. We'd also like to have uh, people who go into industry and can be those links back into the university and also to have those people who stay in the lab and can make the links outward. That, that's also incredibly important to realize that so often the metrics that we see as success and the government puts success, like patenting or like uh, spin out companies, don't tell the whole story. That HQ, HQP and where they go is just as important part of the story. It's fine if you spin out a company, but there's only three people in the country who are going to be helpful to help you grow it. Not going to get very far. All right, thank you. Leah, do we have any hands up or any additional chat questions? There are not at the moment, but I actually have a question if it's all right. Sure, of course. I, I would love to learn, um, the, it was quite interesting, the idea of heart, head, and wallet and, and setting up a narrative like that. And I'm wondering, um, especially in academia, where there's such a, a structured way of writing as, with academic papers and whatnot, do you find people are able to shift to writing that narrative or is that something that people struggle with? Um, it is something, so yes and yes. So it is something that, that we often struggle with because we're so used to talk, talking about what's valuable about the science or what's novel not necessarily economically valuable, but novel about science. That's really what we're trying to emphasize. What is your contribution to research, right? And if you're trying to tell a story to an investor, they don't necessarily care the same way. Because a lot of the time they don't, might not even have the background that you do. So they're taking the fact that you have no, novel science as this person has a PhD, they're probably right about that. But how do you communicate then what is that going to do? How are you gonna translate that into value? That can often be a really different shift in mindset. But if you have that, if you can be the person who bridges between worlds. So in a lot of the programs that, and I'm now definitely repping eye to eye, but a lot of the programs that uh, try to teach entrepreneurship to scholars or to researchers, they're essentially, really emphasizing the skills you don't have, but not the skills that you do. The skills that you do, and this is one of the beautiful things eye to eye brings together, is it creates people who walk between worlds. It doesn't take you out of one and put you into the other. And so being able to, you know, it's almost like being able to speak multiple languages. So you can talk about the scientific novelty of what you do to the networks of people who also have PhDs. But once you understand what your different audiences are looking for, to say, I will believe you on your scientific novelty, but I want to know how is this going to make money? How is this going to translate into a product? How is this going to translate into lives saved or impact? That's something other audiences want to know as well. And the more simple you can make that, um, the easier it is to drink, draw people into your vision. Often that's seen as, well, aren't you just teaching me to dumb down what I'm saying? And the answer is, Absolutely not. It's asking you to communicate it to someone who's not an expert and also to realize that not everyone is asking the same questions that you are. They're asking those questions <clears throat> Pardon me, around impact. Yeah. <laughs> Pardon me. All right. Thank you. Um, Leah, any other questions from the audience? No questions or raised hands at this time. Okay. So um, one final question, and um, it connects to uh, Leah's recent, most recent question. It's really about um, storytelling. And one of the, I think, challenges in encouraging people to think about the development of a story with anecdotes that allows them to emotionally put themselves in the shoes of the, of the, uh, the, of the, recipient of the value proposition of your company, if I could make it very complicated, um, the person who benefits from this and let them see that, yes, I want to get behind this and help. I love that concept of the network safety net. They want to join in, join forces to help make your company and your product successful. And I think mm -hmm. that's a really important concept. And I think um, it's something that in the network and, and men, we really uh, 
put a lot of emphasis in our capacity building programs on communication and Leah runs these programs. And I think that that is such an important thing in order to help people become what you described as a boundary spanner. Um, speaking different languages between disciplines, but also across sectoral boundaries. So university, academic sector, speaking to government and speaking to industry. Um, I think, as you say, there's very different languages. They're talking about the similar, similar things, but they're calling them very different names. And I think that's one of the things that um, the Edmonds really trying to focus on in our capacity building program. And so I encourage anyone, um, either trainees or companies, to uh, get in touch with Leah about what programming we have available because we are making our communication uh, training programs available to industry partners as well as to our trainees and our scientists. So we're really joining forces and I think um, taking your advice uh, and putting it into action as we speak. So I'm really was happy to hear that part of it because it is challenging and as you say, it is not dumbing down the message. It's just tailoring it for optimal receptivity to specific audiences. I thought that was an extremely important and valuable point you made, Sarah. Absolutely. And it's also a place where if you're, say, going for government uh, funding or going for corporate funding, et cetera, it's also a place where, you know, this, this may sound a little bit silly, but it's where I think researchers often have an advantage because we do our homework, right? And so looking into what, what has been the trajectory of that company? Where do they appear to be going? How can you make yourself part of their vision? If you're looking at the government, what have they said they've promised to deliver on? What have they been funded to deliver on? And tying yourself into that. And so it's easy to start with, I have this amazing science and it's incredibly novel, but I've, I've talked about setting your vision and making people part of your story. Just as important is figuring out how to make yourself a, not only a part, but an important part of everyone else's story as well. And that helps weave that network. Well, what a fantastic message on which to conclude this um, fascinating presentation today. I can't thank you enough for this webinar. Uh, and to our participants, thank you for joining us today as well.